thank you all so much for coming out today. Um, this is put on by the Legal Services National Technology Assistance Project, um, which was hosted for the last um, eight years through Northwest Justice Project um, and was made possible uh, by an LSC grant. Um, we're going to do a quick introduction to each of the individuals that are uh, here today, and then we're going to jump into some substantive um, comments. Um, there are or substantive pieces. The there are two ways for individuals to interact and ask uh, questions. The first of which there is a raise your hand button that is on the um, control panel. It looks like this. Um, if you press that, um, I will be monitoring it and I can unmute you to ask questions. Um, the second one and the one that seems to be most popular for individuals is the questions box. Um, it, anything that you type into that question box will go to uh, one of the organizers and we will read those questions aloud. There will be a time for questions at the end of the webinar, um, but just to get a little bit of an idea and make sure people can find that box. Um, if there is a particular topic that you would like to see more in-depth discussion of in the future, uh, because we're only going to be here for about an hour and a half today, um, can you type that particular topic into the questions uh, box just so that you know where that is and so that we've got some idea of where to go with future programming around these uh, topics. We will be sending out a formal survey as part of the follow-up um, to this, so you don't have to get everything in there, but if there is something that you would really like to see more information on in particular, uh, feel free to put that into the question box now. Excellent. And we're moving on to introductions. Uh, my name is Hart Rowe. I've worked with um, National Technology Assistance Project uh, for about the last eight years now, and I'm back on a short um, contract to help put together these trainings, host some community calls, and try to help share best practices uh, within the community here. Next, we have Allison Paul. Um, could you introduce yourself, Allison? Hi, I'm Allison Paul. I'm the Executive Director of Montana Legal Services Association in Montana. We're a statewide program. Excellent. Thank you, Allison. And we've got two individuals from Just Tech here, uh, John Greiner and Anna Steele. I'm John. Um, hi, I'm, I'm John Greiner. I'm the, uh, the president of Just Tech um, and uh, worked in the legal aid community for over 20 years and most recently with Just Tech helping legal aid providers with uh, a range of their technology needs. And I'm Anna Steele. I'm the director of consulting at Just Tech um, and uh, prior to that was in the legal aid community with Legal Assistance of Western New York. Excellent. Uh, Liz Keith from Pro Bono Net. Hi everyone. I'm Liz Keith. I'm program director with a uh, with Pro Bono Net, and we're a national nonprofit that has uh, was founded in 1999, focusing on using technology and strengthening collaboration in the civil justice sector. And uh, I'm based in Northern California. Excellent. Um, uh, from Eastside Legal Assistance Program, Esperanza Pavoa, and. Uh, Alice Elise. Elise. Oh, thank you. Elise. Thank you so much. Hi, this is Esperanza Borboa with ELAP. I'm the program director, and I'll let Elise uh, introduce herself. Hi, I'm Elise Sawaney. I am a DB staff attorney with Eastside Legal Assistance Program. Excellent. Um, so we're starting here um, with uh, Montana Legal Services and their experiences. Hi. So, as I said, I'm Allison from Montana Legal Services. Um, and we define, I think, as a state, except for Alaska and Hawaii, we define the definition of remote in the lower 48. Um, there are only 1.3 million people with over 147,000 square miles. Um, that's the distance across Montana is the distance from Washington, D.C. to Chicago. Um, 
we are we only have any at any given year we only have between 13 and probably 17 attorneys to cover that whole state so we've been doing both remote services and remote work for at least the last 15 to 20 years um, because there really is no other way to do it um, and one of our biggest barriers is geography right so when other people we have a almost a homogenous population so we don't really look at um, racial differences as much but it is an issue but geography is one of our biggest challenges for our clients next slide when um, when Sard asked me to think about doing this panel I've done talks on remote work for quite a few years now um, for the legal aid community and I was trying to think of some tips that we've learned over over our years of experience um, and I came up with three with three groupings. One is meet clients where they are, two is make it easy, and three, create community. So let's go with the next one. Um, if you're gonna meet clients where they are, I really think you have to use the telephone. And um, for those of you that know me on the call, this is my family. My family makes it into about every presentation that I do. Um, and the funny part of the picture is that my daughter, her, her telephone booth says good listener which she is absolutely not. Um, <laughs> but the we learned over time, we have tried every single kind of technology to reach clients, video, just about everything you can think of. And the, we always come back to the telephone. It seems to be the easiest for our clients to use. Um, and now with smartphones, it seems to be the one that most people have, because even if you can't afford a cell phone plan, you might be able to afford a smartphone and go to the library and use it on Wi-Fi. Um, we see a lot of people that do that. I also think it's important to provide information using multiple channels. As we um, have gotten into the uh, COVID-19 crisis here in Montana, we have been trying to do an, a comprehensive uh, community education campaign to reach as many clients and social service providers as we can about all the information that's just coming out endlessly, right? Um, and it comes out really fast. So between Montana Law Help, which Liz helped us set up 20 years ago, um, to, to using social media channels, um, to today we're doing a Facebook Live event where our housing attorney is going to talk and just talk in general about some of the housing in Montana just passed an eviction um, directive halting all evictions a couple days ago. So now she's going to talk about that. We're getting people, lots of people coming to those. It's, um, but we're trying to provide using as many channels as we can. And then we have to consider what do you do with people without internet or a phone? Um, so we're doing some radio ads and we're doing some newspaper tips. We have done a campaign for a long time called the Legal Tip of the Week, and it gets published in about 25 rural newspapers around Montana. And that doesn't cost anything. They all put it in just because they're looking, you know, in Montana, if you have a small rural newspaper, you've got, you're publishing all of the, all of the crime statistics and, and every call that 911 got, right? Or there was a cow in the middle of the road. So if we can say here, this is a legal issue, they're all excited about the content. Um, and then I, I encourage everyone, if you're trying to meet clients where they are, to be patient. Um, it, especially right now, our, our client base has so many things to deal with, and they may not get back to you. And like a lot of programs have you, if you don't call us back in three days, we're closing your file. Um, we've kind of suspended some of that and said, we're going to give people more time to work with what they've got, right? Um, and that's really where they are, not where we are as attorneys. Next slide. Um, and then make it easy. Um, and I wish you guys could hear you because maybe maybe somebody can type in the box where that picture comes from. It's from a movie. Um, so let's see if anybody knows. But um, you got to provide people with the right tools. And you know, when we started doing remote work, we we a lot of our attorneys already had everything they needed. They just had to take it home because they all travel. They're all expected to travel across the whole state. Um, but we didn't have two monitors at home and we didn't have the right chair at home or the, or the scanner. And we've encouraged people to take all of those things home from their office. We purchased a bunch of, our intake staff uses um, all-in-ones, which isn't a laptop, but it's not that hard to grab a monitor with a computer on the back of it and take it home, right? So making sure that they have the right tools so they can do what they need from their home. 
Um, and then I think you need a, a remote work policy. And the reason I wanted to mention this is one thing I've seen coming out is that a lot of federal funders are saying, it's a, you can bill us for what you're doing at home, provided you have a policy that allows you to telework. And so if you don't have that policy in place and people signed up on it, um, like we have a policy, it also has a form. I'm happy to share it with anybody. I know there's been some policies going around on some of the listservs, but we're making sure everybody has a signed form that they have approval to work from home so that if we ever get audited after this, we don't have to worry about it. Um, and I think the policy should encourage people to work remotely. A lot of policies I see even th that may have been before this time <clears throat> are designed to discourage people from working remotely. Um, because because of concerns, a lot of concerns about productivity. And then my last thing about making it easy is use your case management system to track productivity rather than micromanaging people and asking them what they're doing all the time because you're nervous that they're not actually working at home. And that happens with a lot of managers. You get kind of nervous that people aren't actually working at home, but they probably are because we all care about our clients. And you know the ones that might not be, so check in on them. But with other people, look at their time. Look at how many cases they're handling. Look at all that data that you have right there in front of you. Start can tell me if anybody got the picture. Um, next slide. So we, we did get a guess of matrix. Um, no, no, older. Uh, I can't believe nobody in this okay. group knows where that's from. I figured, start, you would know where it's from. Uh, additionally, uh, Brazil is the other it guess. Is Brazil. Well. It is Brazil. Yep. Excellent. Um, Excellent. Price there was also a comment asking for people to share the remote work policies. Um, we do have a slide coming up with um, MIE's list of uh, policies that they're gathering, and Just Tech is going to cover um, remote work policies also. So we definitely have uh, that on the agenda for today. Good. Last slide. And then I think the best thing you can do as a, as a, as a program when you're um, – having all your staff work remotely is create community. Now, this is a picture of all of our staff taken last uh, fall at our all staff meeting, and we ask them all to make funny faces. And I will tell you the funniest thing about this picture is that there's a woman on the far edge um, who's standing up, who has kind of a just a smile on her face, who isn't making a funny, she looks exactly like that in every picture. The ones where we had them making faces, the ones where we had them laughing at each other, the ones where we had people just looking, um, the other funny thing about the picture is it's actually right near an airport. So while it looks like we're standing out in the middle of a field in Montana, there's an airplane right over next to us. Um, but this is an example of people need to be able to have fun together even when you are online. Um, and I'll tell you some of the things we've been doing to try and encourage that. Um, I started doing virtual happy hours and, and we drew names out of a hat. So it's a group of random staff that get together at four o'clock on different days and just talk. And if they want to bring a beverage to their um, to their happy hour, they can. Um, we also do regular communication. It's really important to, to, it might feel like if you're a leader to over communicate during this time. You know, we do once a week calls um, where I have all the staff that are in charge of different parts of the, um, of the COVID-19 response tell what they're doing. So we're constantly telling people what we're doing, how we're doing it, why we're doing it. Um, we do, I do a lot of individual check-ins with people that I would never have done before, but I'm trying to reach out and talk to people. Um, and we did a, like, we're doing funny things. Like we set up a Google Drive folder that has pictures, it's called My New Coworkers, and everybody's posting pictures of their pets or their kids, or somebody posted her coffee pot because she didn't have pets or kids. And it's just, it's just kind of funny and a nice way to get to know people better, especially important things when you're, when your staff is working remotely. Um, and finally, our um, April Fool's joke yesterday was I asked everybody to vote on, I, I said we, we were going to now provide everyone with an emotional support animal at home, and I wanted them to vote on which animal they wanted. And there were a, was a picture of a cow, the same picture you saw at the beginning, a picture of a dragon, and a picture of two of our staff dressed up for Halloween like somebody else's cat. It was very funny. Um, the cat's winning so far, but we'll see by the end of the day today what, what wins. Just things like that that make it a little more fun to come into work when you're just commuting to your bedroom, I think, are really important. That's so you it. mentioned there that um, you were running um, uh, 
Linux or um, outreach directly on Facebook? Could you talk about that a little bit and um, how those have been received? Um, we um, definitely been re get a lot of referrals there and there's a lot of people who are a little nervous about uh, being on Facebook. Yeah, we've been on Facebook for a while because it's where most of our clients are, especially our Native American community uses Facebook all the time. Um, and we're on WhatsApp for our agricultural worker community. Um, but we will do, we just post client related things, um, that link back to our website and our website's hits have gone through the roof since we've been posting things about COVID-19. Um, and if you go to MTLSA, if you look up MTLSA on Facebook, you'll find our page. Um, we also, like I said, we're trying today, we haven't done one before, but we're trying a Facebook live event with an attorney who will be able to answer questions. Um, about housing. Now, obviously, she's not doing advice, legal advice to people, and we have some disclaimers around that. But we found it a very, very effective way to reach clients. And with Facebook, you can pay for directed ads, for directed ads targeted ge by geography, and it's been really, really beneficial, again, to meet people where they are. That's where our clients are, are on Facebook right now. And, and if you don't mind mentioning um, how expensive are the Facebook ads? Um, are they accessible? Um, it sounds like they've been successful for you. They have been successful for us. Um, and I, you know, it, they are they are so inexpensive that that expense does not rise to the level of me approving it. So okay. it, it is not all that expensive. It really isn't. You know, I would say under $100. Excellent. Um, any other questions from the community before we move on to the next presentation? Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate um, the tips on how to build community online. It is so difficult to stay in touch with people when everybody's working remotely. Sure. And I'm happy to take questions whenever. Just okay. email me. <laughs> thanks, Allison, and thanks, Sart, for pulling this together today. Um, so we at Trust Tech have had the privilege of working with a number of you um, throughout the past five or so years, and even before that, on a number of different technology-related issues. And um, so we wanted to first kind of share some of our lessons learned, not only in the past month, but throughout um, the work that we've done as far as responding to disasters or rapid shifts in um, the way that we have to work. So I think, you know, one of the first pieces, and that Allison just proved and Esperanza will talk about later is we can do this and we can do it really well. Um, it will take time and it will take effort and things right now, I'm sure it feels like for a lot of folks that it's really kind of stressful and hairs on fire and balancing work and family and, and everything. But, but I just wanted to gently remind folks that like we can, we can do this and we've done it before. We'll do it now and we'll have to do it we'll have to do it again. Um, and I think that this really um, helps set the tone and set the stage for when um, we unfortunately may have to do this again. Um, there's not a one size fits all approach to moving your office to a remote distributed environment. I think we are slowly getting out of the inform initial information overload phase around moving remote. Um, obviously information will continue to flow. We will continue to share resources. Um, but I think it's really important to remember that we're, we're hearing a lot. There's a lot of webinars. There's a lot of emails being exchanged about what best practices are. And at the end of the day, you really want to focus on the one that works best for your organization. Um, there's conversations about VPNs versus cloud versus um, different remote access software, right? And you know, don't feel like you need to fall into one of the categories that everybody is talking about, right? There's obviously a reason that everybody's talking about that, but remember that uh, the choices that you make about moving your office um, remotely need to be the ones that work best for you and your organization. Um, achieving full efficiency might not happen. We can get really close, but at the end of the day, we just might not be as, an, as efficient as we were in an office environment, and that's okay. Um, I think that as a community, we can get very, very close and we can continue to do really, really good work for our clients and people are already continuing to do that. Um, we're in a position where our work isn't going to grind to a halt as, as uh, advocates for uh, low income people trying to navigate this current situation. And I think that um, it's just really important to 
remember that, that again, that that's okay, that we may not be operating on all cylinders, but we'll be operating on most of them and we'll be doing that well. Um, I think also this is going to happen in stages, right? So step one was getting everybody home and getting everybody at least connected to your environment, at least allowing people to call clients, to email clients, to access the case management system, right? I think many of us around the country are still in that phase. Some of us are getting into kind of the phase two, phase three, right? Let's make that efficient, right? Now that everybody's home, now that we have triaged, right? What is the next step? How do we move into kind of creating that efficiency? And then most importantly, how do we continue those client services? How do we move our clinics to uh, virtual environments, right? How do we navigate the constant questions about how the courts will be handling various uh, issues that our clients are having? Um, information is changing very quickly, and I think it's it's really important to um, make space and time for this to happen over a over a, a period of time and in different phases. Um, one thing to remember, especially around, I think, uh, hardware and software purchases as you move remote is there's a difference between a quick fix and a sustainable solution. It's okay that we're making snap judgments to make sure that our clients can get services and we're making snap judgments to make sure that our staff has access to what they need. Um, but it is important to think, uh, just to know that this is a quick fix over this is part of a sustainable solution for the long term. Um, and this may be iterative, right? We got somebody set up on an old used laptop so they could continue to access what they needed to access, but know that that may not be the long term solution for this person, right? We are in this um, for a longer period of time than I think uh, folks may have initially expected. So, um, we have to be we have to be ready for that. Um, and the final one here, uh, this community and the communities that we all work in are wonderful, right? We all have each other's backs. We are all on the same page. I think we all want to make sure that we continue to communicate with each other, and make sure that we continue co to communicate with the communities that we're working in. I think um, what Allison is doing on the with the Facebook Live is great, right? We need to make sure we continue to engage our client populations to see what they need from us and how we can make sure that we are changing our services to fit to fit their needs right now, right? And so, um, so uh, I think that I think that that's that's really important, and it's important to remember among all the chaos, right, that we have a really really wonderful um, legal aid community, all kind of supporting each other through the through all of this. Um, so now John has, I think policies came up um, earlier. Uh, so Just Tech and John have been working on um, kind of a sample remote work from home policy. So John's gonna take us through some of the um, pieces of that. Okay, a quick switch to internet audio. Um, for some reason, my uh, my cell phone service. I, I so one of the issues are now that everybody's working from home, we have um, a lot of, of new challenges with our internet service providers, and so um, my business internet service is is now uh, working at DSL speeds, um, or slow DSL speeds. So um, we work together um, uh, to build uh, a draft emergency work from home policy. Uh, I want to thank Sart um, for his uh, contributions to that. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of work, at, work from home policies that programs um, have adopted over um, the past years. Um, and I was also um, uh, one of the folks who, uh, who got to uh, um, hear Allison talk about her um, work from home maybe over a, year, a decade ago, I'd say, at an MIE conference. Um, so her program is certainly one of the pioneers, and I really, if she's offering, I would encourage everybody to uh, um, to call her um, or email her so that she can schedule the time, but but uh, really take advantage of her years and years of experience, um, and uh, uh, and then certainly talk to your your um, uh, counterparts as well. Um, so at, at, we're going to uh, include a link to um, to the draft policy um, uh, and in, in the stack, and then start will share it out. Um, separately, but uh, I just wanted to go through a few of the considerations. So, start if you move on to the next slide, um, just so that you have a little context for the uh, for the draft. 
Um, so again, it's different than a standard telework policy. This is, um, at least as conceived, this is, you know, dealing with an emergency. It could be a hurricane or it could be a, a pandemic, but um, things are, are happening quickly. Uh, the environment isn't set up in an ideal fashion, and so we need to um, have a policy that sort of reflects and respects that. Um, there are sort of both tech and non-tech elements to it, um, and a lot of these um, elements really need to be um, thought through by your team. I would not recommend just taking our sample policy and making it yours. I think that would that would uh, um, not be a uh, it would be a disservice, frankly, um, to your team. Uh, it's as Anna was saying, every um, program's a little different. There's no one size that fits all, but I hope that the elements of it are elements that make sense to everybody. Um, I want to encourage folks to um, assess what other policies they have in place that remain relevant or how they may change, and, that, and the policy gets into that a little bit. Um, and then, um, obviously, again, you know, work with your, your, your tech team, um, your legal work supervisors, your grant managers, you know, think about sort of what the implications are across the board um, with this policy, because it's really you're providing guidance. Hopefully you're, um, uh, again, sort of uh, impressing upon folks that this is being thought through, that you're being methodical and thoughtful, um, you know, and, and, and that you're acknowledging that it's gonna be iterative, that it, everything that you're doing today is not necessarily gonna be the same, you know, in, in another week or, or another month. Uh, next slide, please. So again, the, one of the, the big things I think that, that's a little different about an emergency policy is that the risks are much greater. And so managing risk is a big component of this policy. Um, it's really getting, um, I, I think we've always wanted our, our staff and colleagues to be partners with us in risk management, but it is critical right now that we have um, uh, their attention. And so it's really upfront. Um, uh, I think the, uh, I mean, I don't know if you want to think about it as deputizing everybody as a, uh, as a deputy chief security officer or, or, um, you know, data privacy, uh, officer. Um, but, but they, that really needs to be impressed upon them. So we spent a little time going through some of the, uh, considerations that they should, um, have in mind. Uh, and, and again, that we tried to make this policy work for both, um, advocates and, and, uh, and non-advocate staff as well as supervisors, um, but you may want to um, think about additional elements in terms of risk management for folks in different roles. So for instance, HR um, or finance, you're accessing bank um, information from a home computer, that might be an even bigger risk for, for some. So um, uh, again, why it's uh, particularly risky, we're changing the environment quickly, we're iterating it, we're, we're you know, changing the tools we're using, um, people are using tools that maybe they're not familiar with or they're using um, tools in ways they're not uh, normally using them. Uh, one of the providers uh, we work with mentioned that uh, what was a, uh, an agreed upon practice but that wasn't really followed through, that, that folks didn't follow through with was using Outlook for calendaring. And it's like, well, now it's mandatory. That's, that's happening. It's, it, we need to see and, um, and, and understand where people are available, what they're working on. Um, it's it's a good way for supervisors to know oh they've got a, a, you know a deadline using uh, you know again Allison's uh, point about the case management system I couldn't agree with more but using the systems that manage your your case workload uh, in ways that maybe you can you could avoid doing before become critical now uh, next slide please uh, supervision again I. I I think Allison sort of covered this, but it is it is uh, it's really important. Um, and I think um, I would just add that it's really important to think about how you're supporting your supervisors. Um, they're going to have a huge additional workload um, because their their supervision is not going to just be about the legal work. It's going to be about their work environment, their their knowledge of the tools, their adoption, new practices. Um, and so it's it's really going to be um, critical for supervisors to the extent you can to have um, uh, more support and maybe um, have certain responsibilities deferred or taken off their plates. Um, for instance, if they're involved in grant management or grant reporting, you know, think about how you might share that work out so that they're not um, trying to do everything and take care of if they have a family, folks at home, um, you know, dealing with homeschooling potentially. You know, so there's 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 so much going on here that we really want to make sure that um, both staff and supervisors. Um, 
uh, are communicating and and they're doing their best. And, and again, the scheduling, for instance, is again something that's going to change. They may find, oh, my child's falling behind. I need to spend some time um, during the middle of the day, you know, working with them on 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 some you know coursework. Um, so couldn't stress the supervision enough. So there's some elements in there in, in one section, but also um, throughout the policy that relate to supervision and communication. Next slide, please. Um, again, being thoughtful about the environment. Obviously, one of the upsides is like my, my dog comes into the office once in a while and, and gets a, um, you know, a, a scratch. Um, but, um, you know, it's we can throw a lot of equipment out at folks um, and just take this home or or here's a laptop. Um, but I think to the extent we can can breathe a little bit and work through sort of what environment is going to work well. I mean, is it going to be the kitchen table that I'm going to have to break down each night? Um, a lot of people don't have space. Um, you know, if you're in a, in a in a dense urban area, you might have a tiny apartment with you know two people who are rarely there during normal times, but suddenly they're thrust into this sort of experiment. Um, so I think that's that's really critical. And so um, you know, again, as a, as a manager or a supervisor, trying to help your staff figure that out a little bit. Um, and then again, what are the things that are going to make that environment work better over time? And I think, again, Allison sort of pointed out a lot of these things. Is it a headset? Is it a monitor? Um, you know, working a laptop may be great when you're, um, you know, in between hearings at a Starbucks or a coffee shop, but that may not be the most, um, uh, sort of, uh, healthful way. You're looking down at your laptop, your, you know, your, your, your shoulders, your neck pain starts to uh, flare up. Um, and then again, providing them some basic tech guidance. Um, this is a, another area where I would say you want to work with your um, tech folks to um, to tune that to the technologies you're using, um, and then helping them navigate um, confidentiality and that shared environment. How do you maintain um, uh, maintain that um, sort of confidential conversation with a client or or uh, a colleague? Uh, sorry, next slide. Um, so. Um, we're um, going to be posting up the uh, the link is sort of in here. We'll, we'll, we'll make it more um, uh, uh, legible. Um, but we we posted the the draft up, um, and you're free to use it. I would I would again just sort of stress um, uh, that it's it's worth investing some time in uh, tweaking and modifying it um, and having it make more sense for your program. Um, and if we can uh, answer any questions or or help with that, please let us know. Um, I did post the link. Um, in the chat, um, so it is there. It can be cut and pasted or directly clicked on um, there. Um, I did get a chance to look at the policy um, and review it. It it does cover a lot of different areas, um, both the practical um, supervision, oversight, and security and tech. Um, it's also under a Creative Commons by SA license, so anybody can freely take it. Um, edit it, change it, as long as they um, give attribution or credit. Um, so it is a free community resource um, at this point. Um, we've got a question that came in here, um, which is, um, can folks talk about how they're working with or incorporating um, law students um, potentially in remote work or projects that they're working on? Um, I'll give a very short answer there. I've, I've got um, to myself that are working under me. One um, helps with social media and the other one uh, with legal research. And I use an online uh, free tool called Kanban Flow um, that lets me track projects and check in on them um, on a regular basis. Um, they can add notes there whenever they're stuck on things. And then we schedule daily calls um, on the days in which they're available. So, so definitely a great resource. I can just say real fast that we have our interns have gone to working remotely. Um, we've worked with them on security practices like John was talking about. Um, we're having them do research. We also are having them do some client work. Um, we have historically we had limited their access in legal server by geography so they could only get to it from the office. We had to open that up and instead give it to them by case. And so the only the cases mm -hmm. they're working on are the cases they can see. And that's just an extra security practice um, that we put into place. But it seems to be working pretty well. And our summer interns are already asking us what we're going to do. 
um, if they're even going to be able to come. And we've t been talking to them about working remotely. Um, and actually, my my first remote employee um, was from uh, worked out of Montana um, Legal Aid on the beginning of the LSN TAP uh, grant. I had several AmeriCorps employees that worked from out there, um, so it's it's definitely possible to do. But the important part is that regular check in um, process and making sure that you've got a way to interact with them in the community. I would, you know, I would say, so I originally, we call this for staff and volunteers, the policy, but I, I think that there's a lot of overlap between the policy that you'd have for staff and for law students or other volunteers. Uh, obviously, there'll be elements that won't be applicable, and, and then your normal policies, as Allison sort of just mentioned, she normally doesn't let interns access the case management system outside the office. Well, that won't work if the office is not accessible, so there's going to be, again, sort of a context of, of the emergency and its impact on your other policies and what do you need to change um, as a result. But I, I, I think it would be a, a good checklist certainly to go through, does this apply, does it not, um, for law students um, or other folks working, again, remotely who are not staff. Um, it, I think the, the one thing I probably would stress is that they're, they're probably gonna be less familiar with your other policies and so your orientation is gonna be more important um, and the, the need to be confident that they will reach out and ask questions um, when in doubt um, and not sort of launch ahead um, and, and do something that might compromise your, your, your client's information. Uh, so there was a question here um, for staff who share living space with other individuals. Um, what are some ways to maintain confidentiality on calls, meetings, et cetera? Um, I can take that real fast. What we've done is really um, had conversations with people. Our remote, so our remote work forum asked them questions so that we get the right answers. What is your internet? I want to make sure it's password protected and that it's not, they're not in an apartment next to Starbucks and borrowing Starbucks internet, you know? I want to make sure that they're, um, that they have a separate room to be in. Um, and that they can close the door when they're making phone calls. I want to make them aware of what the issues. And so it asks all those questions and they have to answer them. Um, you know, what equipment are you using your own? We require people, as long as we have equipment to give them, we require them to use ours. Um, but, you know, if they aren't, then what are they using and how does that work? And do we, they have permission to do that? And interns would have permission to use their own because we don't have enough to give to all the interns. Um, but I think it's about the conversation and about making sure they lock their computer at night, making, you know, lock it when they walk away, making sure they turn it off, making sure the monitors aren't, um, aren't set in a way that somebody can just walk behind them and see it. I mean, I have a screen behind me right now, which is just kind of funny because there's a treadmill behind it and I didn't want everybody to see the treadmill. But it also keeps my family when they have to go to the bathroom, which is over there, you know, from seeing everything I'm doing when they walk by, right? It's just thinking that through and helping your staff think it through. It's just practical things. Yep, definitely making sure that if they're using a computer um, that is shared, that they set up a um, individual login um, so that those files or other things are not shared. Um, it much easier if they're using a work computer, but I know that a lot of the uh, smaller programs do not necessarily have those um, laptops or those resources. Um, right. Well, I'd add that um, uh, again, uh, some some clients have laptops for advocates, but they don't necessarily have laptops for all the other professionals working in the organization. And so that's where it's becoming, again, a bit of a, a real crunch. And also thinking through, you know, how those other um, uh, professionals are going to actually work or what work they, they, they need to do given the context. So it's, there's a, a lot of work there. Um, again, in a small, uh, in a small apartment with, with uh, a few people, I, I think just having a headset. So right now my headset's off. So at least they only hear one side of the conversation. They don't need to hear the whole conversation. That's for darn sure. Um, uh, and then thinking about, okay, I'm talking in an elevator with other people. You, maybe you don't, you don't mention their name. You don't, you, you try to stay away from the specifics. You can keep your, your conversations a little bit more abstract. Um, but I, I mean, Allison's you know, point, having that conversation, having the supervisor talk with their, their staff or their volunteer about that environment and how it's going to work. 
Um, I love the, uh, maybe Allison would share out her form uh, because I think that would be a really good starting point um, or maybe an ending point for everybody as well. But having some sort of checklist um, to run through would be uh, a great, great way to go. Yeah. Um, so another question that we've got here, um, what work are folks doing now uh, to plan for a backlog uh, when we are later on in the pandemic, i.e. Um, committees to explore new processes or change things? Um, what type of planning stuff do people have in place um, currently to try to look forward to dealing with things as they expand? So one of the things that we do anyway um, is we have an advocacy coordination group that's made up of of people from each practice area and the directors of advocacy. And we've been turning that group to talk. It meets every two weeks and we talk about what, it's all about what people are seeing. What issues are we seeing? What intakes are we seeing becoming more, um, you know, becoming more frequent? What, and, and so they're really, we just took a group we already have and focused it on the future. What do we need to be looking for in terms of resources to ramp up? That's also how we have started all of our online content. What questions are we getting? And one of the things we found and our intake workers are saying is that a lot of the questions they're getting that are COVID-19 related, they can be answered by our law help content. And so they're not even getting to an intake stage. They're just sending people to the content and then they're going, oh, yeah, that answers my question. Thanks. Um, so I think we're trying to, to, to deal with what we expect to be an influx by both really ramping up the content we have online and how we present it, and then thinking about and talking about what, um, where do we need the resources? Where can we move people around um, to the extent that housing becomes really, I mean, we have one housing attorney really for the whole state. How do you deal with that? Well, you put a call out for volunteers. We've really ramped up our pro bono telephone advice project. We've gotten a lot of people. They can sign up for shifts using a, tool called Calendly, so they don't even have to interact with the staff member. The staff fill the appointment, they do the appointment, and it's done. It's a great way to get pro bono attorneys, especially remote, to do remote work. Like I said, we got that set up five years ago because we have to do remote work. So um, it's not that hard to do. And I'm, we're, our staff is always happy to talk, talk to people. This is Liz. Oh. I, I think it's... Uh, I was just going to add, I, I think I think those are all great points. And the one other thing I've been seeing in this area is where there are states or communities that have existing disaster response structures, like in the Cal in the San Francisco Bay Area where I am, there's a longstanding coalition called the Disaster Legal Assistance Collaborative that came together probably six weeks ago to begin planning both the short-term response effort, but to collectively develop field vision about what the long-term needs might look like and that group includes legal services providers but also law firms state bar representatives and then their linkages out to community-based organizations um, emergency response groups from there so I think those linkages and that existing structure will help um, help legal services programs stay attuned to what the uh, what the longer-term needs are um, broadly speaking in their communities and I think, Hi. oh, go ahead. Uh, this is Esperanza. I just wanted to add uh, one other uh, consideration when looking at, you know, how do you respond to things that might be coming up? How do you anticipate is is um, the communication with community partners, especially in communities who are um, speak other languages other than English. And so we um, uh, partner with, with different folks in the community, which include the schools, um, and we meet um, every other week. We are doing these virtual meetings. We, we we're doing that before this, and we're doing we're continuing to do that. I just got off that meeting before I had this one, um, and looking at what is it that's necessary for the community out there. Um, what's what things are falling through the cracks. So it's it's important that we stay in connection with the communities that we're serving, um, and and have those networks in order to be able to. Um, determine as we're trying to figure out how how are we going to do this it has to be it has to include the input and the feedback from the community as well that's so, exactly uh, what I was going to say um, um, this it, next oh. question uh, also kind of follows into something that I know you've been doing with the clinics 
which is any ideas or experiences of how to protect people's phone number of staff um, when calling clients from their own phones. Star six, seven. <laughs> Yeah, our attorneys okay. to use star six seven, and we make sure that that. Well, I'll, I'll I'll talk more about that later. Okay, excellent. Any last comments before we move on to the next section? Well, I I would just add that again, you know, phones, whatever you're doing with the phone um, system. I mean, there was actually there was a uh, a comment made on another webinar that like if you change your phone numbers that you're calling from is to text clients ahead of time um, uh, to let them know it's going to be a new number. Um, so if things are changing, just, you know, sort of thinking about what, you know, what might uh, normally be a, a call that was accepted might get might be sent to voicemail or something. Um, and then just making sure that you, you know, like some some programs are just setting up a lot of individual Google Voice accounts because they're free. Um, but understand the challenges of everybody having their own number that goes with them when they leave the organization. Um, and uh, it, it's not something that you control as an organization. So there are some free short-term solutions out there for phone systems. So if you have an old phone system that isn't um, accessible outside the office, um, you might be looking at, uh, at one of these, um, you know, internet um, cloud-based solutions um, on a temporary or as, you know, sort of Anna was um, you know, talking about, is it a permanent uh, change. I would just make sure you you really spend some time thinking through your voice mm -hmm. and Definitely. the long term implications of it. Okay, we're moving over to pro bono net and uh, remote legal services support guide. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much, Sart and, and Tap. And hi again, everyone. Um, as Sart mentioned, I'm Liz Keith. I'm the program director with Pro Bono Net. Uh, we were founded about 20 years ago and focus on uh, bringing the power of the law um, to vulnerable communities through co-creating digital tools um, that increase legal support for the public and strengthen the work of volunteers and advocates in the civil justice sector working on tackling common justice problems. And um, I, I think as we've touched on already, we recognize in just uh, this webinar that many of you are in very different places with your organizational and community needs. Some of you may be trying to stabilize your operation in this moment and others like Allison and her team have been working remotely as a staff and delivering services through these mediums for many years and are now optimizing and even expanding your strategies in some places. But um, we know that you know all of us need to find routines, new ways to build culture and new ways to work together and support each other in our organizations and, and in our um, in this community I think in ways that Allison and Anna and John all laid out so thoughtfully. So so um, whether you're on that stabilize or optimize end of that spectrum right now or somewhere in between, we wanted to highlight in this segment a few resources that can help um, you and, and all of us meet the moment, as our governor here in California, uh, Gavin Newsom, likes to say in his daily press conferences, uh, regardless of, you know, of where you are today. And um, the first is this publication, the uh, Remote Legal Support Guide, a best practices manual for nonprofit and pro bono innovation that was uh, developed by Pro Bono Net and the Immigration Advocates Network in collaboration with 10 other organizations, several of which are on this webinar today and span rural, suburban, and urban context. This was in um, development for more than a year and released in early March before all of this was, you know, really in the foreground for, for us. But um, on the, the next slide, we wanted to just highlight a, a couple of things that may be helpful as you're, you're thinking about this, this shift. Um, so the first is a survey that we did of 200 organizations about current barriers and practices practices around remote services. And while about 80% of the organizations that we um, that we surveyed expressed enthusiasm for remote legal services, many weren't confident that they could implement those programs effectively. And as technology, as potential barriers to doing so, programs identified things like um, having sufficient staff, having the right partnerships in place, 
needing to stand up training, and then um, knowing what the right technology is to use. And while those are very real considerations, I think the good news is that many of you, through your experience with TIG-funded projects or engagements in long-standing initiatives like statewide websites or online forums or uh, online intake, remote um, hotlines, many of you and your teams will, will already be familiar with this and know very well that technology doesn't exist in a vacuum and you need to think about these surrounding practices. On the, the second survey at, at, at right, um, uh, around this question of, of programs being concerned that they don't have the technical capacity to connect and deliver remote legal support. Again, I think there's some good news there. Many of the projects profiled in this guide and that we've talked about today rely on ordinary and widely used technology to connect people who need information or services to assistance. So uh, that includes phone, uh, texting, uh, online services, using email in creative ways. There was a, a question earlier about the use of law student volunteers and um, there are now many live chat or live help projects in the country. That, that was a technology that was pioneer, pioneered by Montana Legal Services Association and Iowa Legal Aid more than 15 years ago and then expanded in, in some states through scenarios you know, very much like the one we're in today, kind of rapid response and disaster scenarios. There's some live help programs, uh, including one that Pro Bono Net manages in New York, where we're now looking at how do we um, leverage the, the surge in interest from law student volunteers uh, in expanding that service to, to new websites beyond Law Help New York or Court Help and potentially into to new websites or ecosystems. So on the, the next slide, uh, the, the, um, the guide, um, just the structure of the guide beyond sharing the, the survey results, if you uh, just go back one, sorry, um, is that it contains it breaks down in very concrete terms the different models that programs are using in remote services. So these may offer many templates that your programs can adapt, whether you're um, focusing on kind of lower tech approaches or higher tech approaches. And there are profiles of three projects by LSC grantees in the guide, two uh, out of Montana, uh, that, that uh, Montana Legal Services, Allison and her team, um, have helped stand up a partnership with the courts and a health justice partnership, and then uh, a profile of a project that was led by Colorado Legal Services in which they created, launched, and then evolved five clinic models that increase uh, legal resources to low-income communities in Colorado. So, um, I, you know, I think what um, may be helpful for programs that are either in that stabilizing moment or optimizing moment right now is to take a look at some of these and look at ways that um, programs have worked through some of the fundamentals around uh, the program model workflow. It also contains, um, the guide also contains sample volunteer agreements, a sample limited service agreement, and other very uh, concrete and tackle, tactical steps that can help you think about um, remote services, not only as a way to meet current and urgent needs, but as strategies that over the longer term can help you lay the groundwork for new partnerships and services to address uh, the, the long tail um, of, this, uh, of this situation in more robust and comprehensive ways. And the, the last slide um, that I wanted to highlight here in, in this segment were resources that have been um, curated and developed in the last six weeks or so that are now available in the National Disaster Legal Aid Advocacy Center. And um, the Advocacy Center is an area that was uh, stood up uh, off of disaster legal aid in the wake of the 2017 hurricanes and wildfires and is co-managed by Pro Bono Net and Lone Star Legal Aid. Um, but starting about five weeks ago, uh, uh, we along with the Disaster Legal Assistance Coalition in 
in the San Francisco Bay Area um, began meeting and ultimately hosted two national conference calls last month um, that I think had about 80 on one, 80 people on one and more than 100 on another, focusing on two areas. One was to do some initial brainstorming and identification as kind of a national community to identify substantive issues that programs we're seeing and will likely see in the weeks and months ahead, and then, and then also to surface and capture what kinds of tools and strategies programs are using as they shift towards remote services. So out of that, uh, there's now linked from this site uh, a pretty extensive inventory in a Google Doc of legal issue areas that, that programs in those calls identified. Again, that just might help give you a little bit of sort of field vision about what to think about or, or provide some insight on who who else is doing what um, in the national community. That list is also now being used by a, uh, an effort within the, the um, Association of Pro Bono Council, large law firm uh, community to help develop additional kind of FAQs and content that might be helpful for legal aid and pro bono programs in the future. There's also a, a listserv here uh, that's been stood up with uh, uh, representatives from the nonprofit legal aid community, law firms, pro bono programs, others. And then we've tried, knowing that there are other um, efforts in the community, tried to really focus on curating links to really excellent collections of other resources that have been developed by allied networks in housing, uh, public health, victim services, elder justice arenas. So um, those are available here as long, uh, in addition to an, an event calendar uh, that we're doing our best to, to keep up with, with the many webinars and trainings that are coming out. Um, so, you know, just generally, if you have questions about who else might be working through similar issues um, that your program is working through, whether that's related to remote services technology or some of the substantive issues and just how to organize and, and um, kind of network as a community in your region or your state, uh, please you know, reach out to us if we can be a resource, if we don't know the answer um, or if it's outside of our area area of expertise, we'll do our best to um, connect you to other resources or uh, people in um, our national network and beyond that might have, uh, have grappled with similar issues. So, thank you. Thank you so much and a wonderful guide. It, it highlights um, several uh, good organizations, including several that I've worked with on other uh, projects. So thank you for sharing that. Um, a quick question here before we move on to the next section, um, which is, um, is this a time to be taking on um, volunteer attorneys? Are the late organizations um, looking for that? And are there particular processes that you put in place uh, for uh, working remotely with uh, volunteer legal staff? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I think that will depend in part on where your program is at, at this moment and if you have um, an, a strong existing pro bono program that you're uh, looking to convert to an online medium, that's probably going to be a lot easier in this moment than standing up a new one. What I would say generally in our conversations with uh, law firms, whether that's firms here in California where I am or in New York and other parts of the country where um, my colleagues are, the firms are saying, you know, what, what to the, to the legal services programs, what do you need and how can we be supportive to you? How can we adapt to the needs and the capacity that you have in this moment? So, um, you know, really uh, many of the firms have been incredibly supportive and helpful in being uh, very proactive partners in figuring out um, how can they deploy their capacity in a way that will work um, with the needs of the legal aid program and the, the needs of the community that those those programs are, are serving. Um, there, I think there, there are other kind of resources coming out, um, you know, that I've seen on, on email listservs and other places around the question around support for volunteers. But um, in the, the Google Doc that's linked from um, this Advocacy Center legal response page, there's notes from the, those first 
couple of calls about specific strategies and programs tools are using to supervise and support volunteers. So um, I think you know that might be worth a look, and uh, uh, we'd be happy to be you know a, a resource on more um, concrete strategies as well. We've been using um, remote excellent. volunteers. We've been using remote volunteers for quite some time and um, have a whole a whole bunch of of tools around that um, information, little videos on how to use the case management system, um, releases, um, and I think that would be a whole webinar actually. Start on using remote volunteers. Uh, definitely, um, I've been working with the Northwest Consumer Law Center here, um, and they've been using. Um, remote experts to cover some of the different legal issues that um, clients are facing in webinars and YouTube videos within the last week and a half. So there's definitely some opportunities um, to take advantage of that expertise and bring it out to a broader audience using social media and other tools. Excellent. Um, we do have a pretty good amount of questions. We've got two quick uh, pieces for presenting still. We're going to um, go through those quickly and um, then cover as many questions as we can. Um, we will also be hosting informal roundtables um, starting next Thursday um, where there'll be hopefully an opportunity to just cover people's questions and share knowledge in the community. For our presentation, we're going to start, we're going to have um, Elise start out for us. These yeah. slides you're looking at are for our clinics, and I'll talk to those in a minute. But if Elise, if you can kind of share um, the experience of the staff attorneys um, at ELAP. Yeah. Um, as Espy mentioned, I am a staff attorney at ELAP. Um, the ELAP staff attorneys are actually really fortunate in that we already had the ability to work remotely um, before we were deep in the throes of the pandemic. Um, all of the staff attorneys have Surface laptops that we're able to like bring with us home or to work and put in a docking station. Our um, files are kept in a cloud-based server. Our client management is Legal Server, which is also um, web-based. We use DocuSign to get um, documents signed by our clients. Um, we have a phone program that's really neat called Audion that allows us to forward our work numbers to our cell phones. Um, and it also sends us like an MP3 recording of a voicemail that's left on our work phones, which is really helpful, especially right now since we're not going into the office. Um, in, terms of, in terms of remote lawyering, it has been fairly difficult. Um, there's a lot of changes going on right now um, and a lot of challenges that we didn't anticipate. Um, one of the main challenges that we're noticing, um, especially with many of our low income clients that we serve is that they don't all have the same access to technology um, and the resources that they typically would have used like the library to go and get documents scanned or print out documents they no longer have access to. Um, so we're having to find creative workarounds to get documents um, to us. Uh, one example is I created a step-by-step -step guide for my clients with screenshots um, to help walk them through how to scan documents to me using their cell phones. Um, in terms of interfacing with the courts right now, we're receiving new guidance on a daily basis, pretty much um, by last count. We were at emergency order number 15, um, but I may have missed one during this webinar. Um, in terms of the family law realm, the hearings are being really limited to emergency orders. Um, since me and my colleagues work in domestic violence, all of our work is continuing to go forward, um, but other civil litigation isn't really happening. Um, everything's been switched to telephonic hearings, which includes um, our clients and respondents in cases, um, except for our parties who are in custody. Uh, we're tr having to figure out how to submit things to the courts in a way that protects our clients, um, but also gets the information to the court. There's certain information that you have to submit with an order um, for a domestic violence protection order in order for that to be served. 
but um, we're really hesitant to s send that via email because email is discoverable. Um, so we're having to find these workarounds in order to protect our clients. Um, one of the other things that we're dealing with is we don't really get acknowledgement or confirmation of our submissions right away. Even when we're filing emergency orders, um, we're learning to be really patient, but continuing to advocate for our clients to ensure that nothing falls through the cracks. Um, in terms of domestic violence cases, which is primarily the work that I do, um, I'm not sure if other people are recognizing this in their communities, but we have an uptick of domestic violence, particularly in King County. I think it's up by 25% with the stay at home orders in place. Um, the Protection Order Advocacy Office is started to encourage people to fill out documents online using legal atoms, um, which helps survivors complete a full set of court documents for a domestic violence protection order. Um, even when I was watching the news the other night, I've noticed that they started to publicize that um, on the news, which is really helpful for clients who wouldn't normally um, receive that kind of information because it's really difficult to get information to survivors right now when everybody's stuck in their home. Participating, I'm sorry that I'm going quickly. Tell me if I need to slow down. Um, we've been participating in telephonic hearings, which is also uh, kind of a Actually, we have two quick oh. questions. Um, yeah. First, what was the phone program that you mentioned um, for forwarding um, voicemails and um, the uh, remote access? Uh, Audian. It's A U D I A N. I think it's actually on the next slide, too. Oh, okay. Excellent. Um, and then people were definitely interested in the uh, phone scanning guide. Um, we'd love to get a copy of that and share it widely. Yeah. But I've probably got six people who've asked for it already. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I can send it to you. Um, so in terms of uh, participating in telephonic hearings with the court, that's also kind of challenging um, and it's really delayed a lot of the court process. Um, which is particularly frustrating when you're working with a survivor um, because everything is very high stress and um, there's a lot of safety and lethality concerns and it's kind of having to um, like reassure your client but also not knowing when you're actually going to be able to be heard by the court. So you spend your, you have to email the court with your phone number and your client's phone number and spend the morning waiting to get a phone call and then you might get an email saying, we didn't have time to get to you, so we're going to do it in the afternoon. And then you'll spend your afternoon waiting for that phone call. And then they might say, sorry, we could, did not get to you today, so we're going to have to put you on the docket for tomorrow. Um, the other thing that's pretty difficult is when you're in court, you're able to stand next to your client and um, really, like advise them uh, before they respond to any question from the judge. And we've had to find ways to get around that. Um, I've set up a Google Voice number because I'm normally on my phone during the um, hearings so that my clients can send me a text message if they have a question about what's going on so I can tell them like what is happening and um, what the judge is asking of them to say, et cetera. Um, there's the other really big challenge, I think, um, especially in the work that me and my colleagues do, because it's domestic violence, is um, exposure to secondary trauma, which is something that we talk about a lot. Um, but being in the office is really helpful for that, because you're able to just talk to your colleagues and like debrief with them or like walk into somebody's office and vent, which I've done to SBN more than one occasion. Um, so we're having to find creative ways to debrief. Um, we do weekly staff meetings now and weekly legal team debriefs with happy hours. We've started sharing funny videos with one another. One of my colleagues actually bought me a singing bowl or a meditation bell, and I've started just sending videos to um, my fellow staff attorneys, just reminding them to take breath. Um, but yeah, we're all ad adjusting, and I think the biggest thing for us right now is um, to remain, pa remain patient and flexible. Um, but then also continuing to advocate for our clients, which is a balancing act at times. So, um, Sart, do you want me to go ahead or do you wanna do some questions now? 
Um, good. Let's go ahead and finish uh, your presentation, and then I've got a few more questions before the next okay, one. Okay, great. So, um, as I mentioned before, my name is Esperanza Barbo. I'm the program director, and thank you so much, Sark, for including us and in, in, uh, in, in this webinar. And it's great to hear what everybody's doing. And Allison, I'm going to want to talk to you later. <laughs> um, uh, and you've seen a, a, a shot here of a, of a page of our timeline for transitioning to remote work. Um, unlike the staff attorneys for our clinics, they are in-person appointments. And so the transition happened pretty quick. And, um, you know, we anticipated in February that we were going to need to do this and start it, you know, just kind of thought about what are we going to need to do. Um, and just started doing those things. And that's been up there for a little bit. This this page has been up there for a little bit. So hopefully you've had a chance to look at it. We've gone from the last week in February to beginning to plan for the transition to um, the 9th of, of March. All our clinics are remote. Um, and soon we found out we needed to do a shout out for more attorneys and got um, really great response from attorneys. Um, kind of what Liz was talking about, those uh, law firms that said yes we want to help so um, then the 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 challenge is uh, you need to provide some training for some attorneys on landlord tenant issues or on UI and so we've started doing that um, we've had three webinars thus thus far last week we had two one on uh, veterans issues and another on landlord tenant um, rights uh, for attorneys and today we had another one or will it's actually happening now as we speak? Uh, no, wait a minute. Was that yesterday? No, it was yesterday. Sorry. There's so much going on. It's kind of hard sometimes to keep track of when did this happen? Did we already do it? Yes, we did. Uh, we did one yesterday on the landlord tenants' rights for um, community partners and community members, and there was a we we maxed out on that one um, in terms of the participants. So we'll be doing it again and it recorded. Um, and the reason we're going to do it again is because, as we all know, things are changing. And what the reality is today around what is available and what we can do to support people around land or tenant issues or any other issues, by next week, those things are going to change. Hopefully, they'll get better. Um, and so it, it's incumbent on us to stay on top of that and to stay on top of what are the issues uh, that are affecting the community so we know what it is that we should be putting forward doesn't mean that we have to do it and we don't have to reinvent the wheel that there are there are other organizations within king county or the state of washington that are doing amazing work and doing webinars and recordings and youtubes and what have you and so we will put that forward and and share those resources with people so that we're not the only ones doing that all our staff are working remotely now and have been since the middle of march um, we transitioned into that a little bit before we got to that point. And then maybe we could go to the next slide, Sart. Okay, so the three steps, and some of this you've heard from Allison, from Liz, um, uh, Anne, and um, is the three steps for us is communication, communication, communication. And when we talk about communication, it's, um, uh, we, we mean communication with um, um, not just our staff, but, oh boy, um, it's communicating with staff. It's being really clear and uh, with an understanding of what is it that we're doing and who's responsible for what. Because I can, as we're moving really fast, we will step all over each other. And before you know it, we're confusing clients, we're confusing attorneys, and so we really have to have a clear understanding of who's doing what, who's responsible for what. Um, we so so having that for for the for the staff that are working our intake folks and the the person that's doing all the um, the work around the um, know your rights workshops and the CLEs and what have you, um, uh, communicating with um, clients is extremely important. We, um, what we did is we made sure to um, inform clients um, that, we're, that we are doing remote um, and to tell them to be ready to take their call. So if they have an appointment at two o'clock on Wednesday, because that's when we have the clinic, that, and their phone rings, 
Um, they're going to get a call from a block number at two o'clock on Wednesday. Please pick up the phone. If you don't pick up the phone the first time, the attorney will call back a second time. If you don't pick up the second time, the attorney will leave, will ask you to please call us to reschedule because we're, they're not going to be able to keep calling back and calling back and calling back. So we'll just reschedule them and get, get them in as soon as possible into the next clinic. And we've, um, I should mention that, um, before um, COVID-19, we had 33 clinics that we did per month. And after COVID-19, we are doing 45. We added 12 more clinics. And we did that with the help of um, law firm attorneys, uh, corporate attorneys that um, want to help. And so, I mean, we're still working bugs out of this um, uh, in terms of communicating with um, attorneys, um, what we have asked them is to show up, you know, to, to, to be on the call because the first day that we did this, I think was the, uh, I can't, it was the Thursday. Uh, anyway, I have a date somewhere, but the first day that we did this, we had clients calling us saying the attorney didn't call me the attorney because it's hard to when you're working from home and if something else comes up you're going to deal with that if you have children at home you might deal with that and before you know it an hour's gone by and you haven't made that call to the client so um we just kind of reinforced that please please make sure that you're calling the clients at the time we told them to expect your call use uh star six seven to block your phone um uh, and um, the other important piece for attorneys is their notes once they met with the client. So they email the notes with no identifying markers in the notes. They just put one, two, three, and we know that's client one, client two, client three. We already know that that attorney was scheduled for a particular clinic, so we don't have to figure out who, who you know, where, what clinic that was for, and um, and we're able to put those notes into legal server. Um, and we are also listening to the attorneys in terms of what kind of trainings do they need um, because we have we do have attorneys in the 33 clinics that we that we had before these are all attorneys that are practicing attorneys in their field for the most part and the additional clinics not necessarily so so we need to make sure that whatever training they need um, we're staying on top of that and providing that training and so and because we have attorneys that practice in those fields it's not that hard for us to figure out where to go for that um, the second thing is setting up staff and this has been mentioned many times is you know all the the equipment and whatever it is that that we need and um, and the the mention earlier about um, taking care of ourselves of secondary trauma and just taking care of ourselves is extremely important um, you know, I had a meltdown last week. It was, it's, it, this is hard. And when you're, when you're at home and I can't turn around and tell my husband, I'm, 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 I'm sad and I'm just grieving because of this client and then tell him what happened. I can't share that with him. And it's just him and I here. And so I called a colleague and I told her, I just had a meltdown and I am not a meltdown kind of person. If you know me, I, you just not that kind of person but it was just too much. I had already filled up and I didn't have anywhere. So um, I appreciated that that photo that Elise sent of the little bowl that you have. Um, I think I'm gonna print it out and put it somewhere in front of me so that I see it all the time um, and remind me to take that moment, just to, you know, a minute or two, just to kind of reflect and, and you know, de debrief myself. Um, but that is extremely important because we're human and, and everything that's happening is, is very difficult. Um, so th the other thing is keeping leadership up to date. We have, let's see, um, for the program staff, we meet every Monday. We have a virtual meeting every Monday. The directors meet uh, twice a week. And if we need to, we, need, we meet more. The legal staff meets at least once a week, right, Elise? Right. And so there's constant communication and whatever it is that, I'm an organ, I'm a long time organizer. So putting these kinds of things for me together is, is, is not a stretch, but I pull in the people I need to help me think about what is gonna be needed for it because I'm not an attorney. And so I need attorneys to help me figure this out. 
Um, so, but keeping the leadership abreast is important for me because I can get ahead of everybody <laughs> and start just working, right? Start doing things. And I, I, we can't do that. We have to make sure that we're talking to each other, that the left hand knows what the right hand's doing so that um, we have the most effective program possible um, and services for the, for the clients. So I'm gonna stop there because um, I can go on, but I'm gonna stop there and so that we can do some questions. Excellent. Thank, thank you so much for that presentation. I'm going to um, go through two more quick questions here. Then I'm going to go through the last four slides that we have um, and then close up with the, any more questions. I do understand that there are um, about 20 more questions or 15 or so in the queue. We will be doing a roundtable um, next week and I'm going to give people some of the resources where they can uh, hopefully answer some of these questions also. Um, one of them was, does anybody have um, any advice for submitting exhibits electronically, um, especially when they're dealing um, with kind of the impeachment process? Like how to e-file? And I, I think a lot, a lot of the answer to that is going to be very different in which counties you're in, um, because some counties will let you e-file, some or most counties are adding some ad hoc um, e-filing options, um, and they're moving a lot of the hearings to um, uh, deposition-based or um, uh, phone-based. Um, I think I'm, we might need a little more context for that one in in particular. Um, Another question that we had, um, which is on um, electronic signatures, um, any advice people have for um, gathering, collecting, and uh, getting signatures, especially when people may not have a computer? We um, use DocuSign for that, and our clients are able to sign documents with their phone. Um, mm -hmm. It's been really helpful for us, uh, especially in terms of situations where you need the client's actual signature, like on a declaration that you're submitting to the court. Um, I've seen commissioners throw out things where they like have a picture that is just been pasted in that little spot, um, but I haven't had any issues with DocuSign. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, we DocuSign use... is definitely a great tool. <laughs> Yeah, um, for the court for court stuff. Um, what we use for our, all of the things we need for LSC compliance or other or our own releases and retainers, um, we just we just text people and use the e-sign standards. And so if they confirm if they if they know what they're saying and then you confirm they said it afterwards through text and digital forms and legal server, we get all our signatures that way and it goes right into the client's file. It's we've been doing that for a couple of years. It's really really slick and we didn't have to buy a special program. Excellent, that's a great process there. Um, I'm posting um, in the chat uh, three options on digital signatures. Um, DocuSign, which was mentioned, um, PandaDocs um, has made itself free during this um, uh, in response to the current crisis um, and HelloSign is um, a, a lower cost, uh, very easy to use option there. Um, uh, the other thing is definitely check your local rules. Um, those have often or have recently sometimes changed for how they will accept uh, digital signatures. Um, sorry, another thing. Oh, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say another thing to note um, is that a lot of us are nonprofits, and if you don't already use TechSoup, that's a really great resource to get a lot of these programs at a really low cost or free. Definitely. TechSoup has some wonderful discounts. And Sart, on the, the question that may have been about e-filing, um, 
there are two resources that just may be helpful. There's the, the self-represented litigation network for people that aren't aware of that. Uh, they've made some resources available in um, a COVID-19 resources page, and then there's a robust discussion going on uh, on one of their working group listservs about how courts are transitioning or expanding remote services. And then the National Center for State Courts also has stood up um, now a very robust resource center with information about you know, where um, in-person proceedings have generally been suspended, where virtual hearings are now being made available um, that might be helpful. And I just posted the link um, to the Self-Represented Litigants Network's um, COVID-19 resources. That is definitely a great one. Um, we've got uh, 30 seconds here. I'm going to cruise through a few quick slides um, and then close things up. Um, the first thing that I want to mention is that um, there's a wonderful email list for LSNTAP. Um, it includes about 600 legal services professionals um, with different levels of tech literacy. A lot of the topics that we've talked about today have come from that uh, discussion um, that we've had in on that list, sir. Um, so it's definitely a great resource here. I will put the link to that um, into the chat here. Um, we are also, um, we've got a YouTube channel with about 300 videos on different tech topics. Um, April 2017, we did a whole topic on working remotely that included uh, Xander Kars, Karsten and other um, professionals. Um, oh, very little of the content actually overlapped this, and it's another hour and a half long on remote working. Um, MIE has a very good resource up right now. It's got about 30 different articles ranging from um, other projects, um, policies, it's aimed at uh, managers, um, but it has things like um, potential letters to send out to funders um, in this situation about what's going on, um, letters for staff, policies. Um, they're updating it daily um, and adding things from the community. Um, Patricia um, is looking for more policies. The things that we get from this webinar, I will also be submitting to them to add to that repository. Um, they're also going to be coming up with some webinars and other um, community resources aimed at managers um, in this situation. Um, I'm losing the slides there. We are. Um, we are also doing a round table. Um, April 9th, so next Thursday um, at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the registration link is on the LSNTAP um, email list, and I will send or and on lsntap.org. Um, it's more of an informal discussion. There's not going to be presentation, but there will be experts from uh, the community and members from the email list there to just answer people's questions and talk about the things that you run into as you try to implement the things that you've learned about, um, or as you respond to uh, potential projects that you're putting together um, with the LSC grants um, that are I know people are applying for um, tomorrow. So we're going to continue as long as there is need um, that community sorry, it's, discussion it's around this. Hmm? Sorry, it's due today. Oh, it's due end of day today. Sorry. Yeah, about that. I think by midnight Eastern. Um, but okay. yeah, just thank you I, so I much for that gonna clarification. Be due Friday, but they moved it up. Okay, thank you so much for that clarification, and I will definitely correct that online wherever I've uh, posted about that. Um, excellent. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to everybody who was involved in this. Uh, Montana Legal Services, um, ELAP. Uh, Northwest Justice Project, Pro Bono Net, uh, Just Tech, uh, National Technology Assistance Project, um, and funding for this was made available through Northwest Justice Project as part of a grant um, from LSC. Um, we are a little bit over the hour and a half. Um, thank you so much. This, these slides will be available um, online. We will post them to our blog. 
We, we will also uh, send out a link to the video uh, within a few hours here after we go through editing it and putting it up online. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for putting this on. Bye, no everyone. Thank, Thank you. you sir. Bye -bye. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Um, uh, there was a question here. I will um, grab the resources from chat and put those into the follow up email and into a blog post. Um, oh, thank so you for that. I'll, I'll capture as much of this as I can and feel free to email me um, if there was something uh, that we missed or if you have a particular question about this stuff. Um, I can definitely get you in contact uh, with presenters or follow up um, with any of the topics that were talked about here.